I'm Jackie, I'm from Matific, the online maths resource, and welcome to our webinar today about what makes a great primary school teacher of mathematics. We have some fantastic speakers for you today. I'm very excited about it. <clears throat> Just to let you know, get rid of my little froggy there. <clears throat> I was a primary school teacher. You can probably already tell <laughs> the way I speak. But yes, I was in the classroom for 28 years before joining Matific and the wonderful world of digital mathematics about seven years ago. And I was always trying to find new, inventive, exciting, inspiring ways to teach maths in the classroom. It's a challenge, isn't it? Um, so I'm hoping that our wonderful guest speakers today are going to be able to help us all with that. So welcome everybody, wherever you are. I know we've got people all around Australia, New Zealand, and probably beyond as well. So wherever you are, I hope you're safe and well, and I hope the year has gone well for you. Now, I want to actually make a start by getting you involved. Are you ready? Okay, so I'm going to show you the agenda. And as you can see, the first thing on there, it says a quick poll. So I'm going to do a poll with you shortly. And then we have the wonderful Dr. Christine May, who's going to do a presentation for us. I'll show you a little bit about digital maths, a quick presentation there and about how you can actually go beyond the screen. You'll see more about that shortly. Across the Tasman we go to Dr. Olin Johnston joining us from New Zealand. That's going to be wonderful. And a special extra guest we have who's up in Queensland, Matt Tobin. Welcome to you too. We're going to meet all of those people shortly. And of course, there will be some time for a and Q&A at the end. You don't have to wait until the end to share your questions. So if you use that Q&A box, anytime you think of a question along the way that you want to ask one of our panellists or myself, just please pop it in that Q&A box um, and we will get to it at the end. I'll try to get to everybody's questions. So yeah, we'll, we'll do that hopefully at the end. We'll have some time. All right, are you ready for the poll? In fact, you know what, before we do the poll, I might get our guests to say hello. How about that? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If you could turn your videos on, please, our wonderful guests, just for a moment, if you're there, Christine and Alwyn, there we go, and Matt. Hello and welcome. Hi, everybody. So we've got Christine, Alwyn, Matt. Hi and welcome. I just thought everybody might like to see your face before we make a start. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. All right, you can go into hiding again now. <laughs> and um, I'll go back to sharing my screen. And we're going to do that uh, little, I'll just get it back here. Oh, there we go. We'll get it onto the right screen for you. And we are going to do a poll. Are you ready? Let's launch this poll. Now, I was saying to you that I was always trying to think of new and exciting ways to teach mathematics in the classroom. I'm hoping you can all see that poll there. Great. Some people are already answering. If you could only pick one of these things, which one would it be? So what would you most like to achieve in your math teaching? So would it be improved test scores? Would it be more variety of lesson styles? Would it be increased student engagement? Or would it be greater proficiency and confidence to teach maths concepts? So I'll give you about 20, 30 seconds or so. I can see lots of people are already answering. So thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I just thought it might be interesting to see uh, your preferences there. And hopefully by the end of this little webinar, you'll achieve all of the above. <laughs> Be nice, wouldn't it? All right, I'll give you a few more seconds. Oh, gosh, we've got lots of people responding. 81% of you have already answered, and I'm going to show you the results in a moment. We'll give you five more seconds. Oh, okay, are you ready? Oh, I'm just wondering why it didn't. Uh... Oh, let's see if we can get the results of that poll. It's just switched off. I could see. I'm sorry, I don't know why it has it's not letting me share those results unfortunately, but I was keeping an eye on it. So I can tell you um, it was the last one by far was actually the winner, which was greater proficiency and confidence with teaching concepts, which makes sense in a way because if you've got that, the others will all follow, won't they? And interestingly, the first one about improved test results from students, it's funny that really that should be all of our goal. But if you're doing everything else right, that will naturally follow. So I don't think that needs to be the focus because if you're doing everything else you can, that will follow. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing there and I'm going to welcome and introduce Dr. Christine May. 
Hello, Christy, and you are also in Sydney, I believe. Yes, uh, good evening, Jackie. It's a real pleasure to um, meet you this afternoon. And I'd like to say um, a huge thank you to everyone tonight um, for everything they're doing in their roles in education to improve mathematics teaching. I think it's a really exciting opportunity um, to connect with others and to share ideas. So thanks for bringing us together. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to hear from you. Um, and just in case you don't know, yes, Christine is in Sydney. She's the K-12 Mathematics and Humoracy Specialist for Sydney Catholic Schools and amongst other things, I'm sure there's many things you do. But I'm going to hand it over to you if you'd like to share your screen and I'll disappear for a little while and hand it all over to, to Christine. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jackie. Well, good evening, everyone. A topic that's close to my heart, and I was really interested in the results of the poll because um, that, that most popular response about greater knowledge and confidence for teaching concepts is something that's very close to my heart and, and I guess my life's endeavour. So what makes a great teacher of mathematics? I'm going to begin with a fairly broad sweeping statement, and it's a lot. But I think what makes a great teacher of mathematics is people with the positivity, passion, knowledge and commitment to transform student learning in ways that truly ignite the interest, thinking and self-efficacy of their students. But to come down to a more practical level, I think a great teacher of mathematics has the art of crafting a really careful balance between a number of elements. And I'm not going to name all of them, but I'm going to name three that I believe are key up front. The first thing is that great teachers of mathematics, they can teach for understanding and they can use those rich, challenging tasks and problems to stimulate their students' communication and reasoning and really engage their students in exploring and testing ideas. But it doesn't stop there because great tasks and problems are opportunities, but they're not teachers. So good teachers balance those experiences with their ability to bring the really important mathematical properties and principles to the surface in ways that make them salient for students. And they use their students' insights wherever possible and use their, their students as a vehicle through which to teach. And again, understanding something is not the same as knowing it. We know that students need multiple exposures to ideas and frameworks and language in order to be successful, that understanding is not knowing. So alongside all of this, once students understand and can articulate those properties and principles, great teachers develop their students' fluency. And they do this by providing really targeted opportunities for students to practice, master, automate, select and apply the concepts, facts, skills and procedures that they're learning about. And I like to talk about two types of practice that great teachers provide. Most teachers know the importance of practice, but they tend to provide that massed practice. You know, when we're learning about a particular topic, let's say multiplication and division, we do a lot of practice on multiplication and division. And it seems while we're doing it that we're getting quite good at it. But of course, we also need that spaced practice. Quite often we think after teaching a topic that our students have forgotten. But in reality, if we have truly learned something, if we've transformed understanding into knowledge in our long-term memory, we can't really ever forget it. What we need is to remember where we left it. So that spaced practice that great teachers provide beyond teaching a topic where we retrieve the knowledge and apply it in a range of contexts is a hallmark of a great teacher. Now, I've got my big and there because already this is a lot and this is about balance. This isn't about one or the other. You need all of this to be a great teacher. But the way in which you do it really needs to be done in a way that establishes those really productive, inclusive learning environments where literally every student 
recognizes that they have something to learn. So every student should be struggling a little bit in these great uh, at classrooms of great teachers. But every student should also know that they've got something to contribute to the learning of others. So they should all believe they need to learn something and they should all believe that they have something that they bring to that lesson, which is valuable. And I think where we have these things in place, we have the opportunity for a great and successful mathematics education. The other thing about our great teachers of mathematics is that they really know why and how they teach mathematics. So these are the teachers who, you know, if they walk into an elevator and a person who says, I hate mathematics, I was never any good at it, I don't know why we bother teaching mathematics to students, these great teachers are advocates of mathematics because they recognise and can articulate the role of mathematics in solving problems in the world around them. They can talk about the role of mathematics for developing essential numeracy skills. They know how important mathematics is for their students to learn to think logically, critically and creatively. They recognise that students must learn to identify patterns and relationships. And as part of that process, that students need to develop a positive self-concept and walking around in life feeling that you don't understand mathematics and are not numerate is really not um, a good foundation for a positive self-concept. They recognise that mathematics has an opportunity to help students become self-motivated learners because it does present challenge and how to use mathematics to develop resilience in solving problems that are relevant not just to the mathematics classroom, but to life beyond it. So they know why they teach mathematics and they are advocates of the mathematics to their students, to other teachers in their school, to their parent community, to the leaders, to the systems they work for, and also to everyone they meet on the street. And the way in which they teach mathematics is really clear, that I know a great teacher of mathematics teaches first for understanding, but doesn't stop there. It's not about understanding or fluency. We don't enter into that debate. It's about both understanding and fluency and they know how to get there, they get there through those opportunities for students to explore and then connect mathematical concepts to the types of mathematical techniques that relate to them, and then the opportunities to apply those concepts and techniques to solve a range of problems, both routine and non-routine, and in ways that stimulate, it gets students to communicate their reasoning, not just to explain, but to re be really coherent and clear about the mathematics they're using. And in saying that, I just want to just come back to something that Hattie and Anderman said in their global handbook on education that's quite often glossed over because it's in the introduction. And what was said, which is a broad and sweeping statement across all effect sizes, is that students learn more when they perceive that their teacher is focus, focused on understanding, but that understanding is not knowledge. We need both. I'm going to give you an example of what I need to make this quite practical. So let's imagine that we were teaching a topic like talking about the principle of equality in addition and subtraction. Now, I've, I've taken some content from New South Wales, where I, where I um, live and work, and I've just picked one little dot point to make this clear. So when students are learning about this principle of equality, sometimes it's about finding missing numbers, and that's fine and dandy. But great teachers call out the important principles and properties of mathematics. It's not about doing lots of mathematics. It's about bringing these important principles and properties to the surface. The one I've chosen for today is apply the associative property of addition to aid mental comp computation by forming groups of 10. So I quickly just made up a task. So it, I don't think it takes long if you think about it. But of course, you need to know what this means to design the learning, don't you? So I'll give you a moment just to read what my little task here is for these imaginary year three students. I list the numbers from one to 10 inclusive. And suddenly, I realise that I can find the total of the numbers in my head by rearranging and regrouping them using the combinations I already know. What might be the best way to rearrange and regroup the numbers to make them easy to add mentally? 
And I just encourage you now, if you've got a piece of paper or mentally, to just think about those numbers from one to 10. Imagine what they look like if they were written in front of you. And then think about how you would rearrange them and regroup them to find the total mentally. And of course, as I give you some wait time, I highlight that among many other teaching strategies, taking time to give wait time to students before telling them answers or supporting them is very, very important in that mathematics classroom to engage them in productive struggle. Of course, as well as this initial question, a great mathematics teacher entices students to go beyond an answer into recognising and communicating why and how the mathematics works more broadly. So if you found that first question to be something that you, you were in fact familiar with and could do standing on your head, a great teacher is always ready to take you further. So my further question is to say, how could you apply that same idea to add the even numbers from 1 to 20? Or if you like, all of the numbers for 1 to 100, or beyond that, any increasing or decreasing number pattern where the difference between each consecutive pair of numbers is a constant difference. How could you apply this idea? If I was looking at your work and or moving around a year three classroom, I know what I'm looking for. A great teacher of mathematics knows the property and they know what they're looking for in their classroom. So I'd be looking for perhaps some equivalent number sentences, maybe something like this, that recognising those number bonds for 10 and grouping them. Now, the students might not use group or grouping symbols formally. They might be circling these numbers or just connecting them. But essentially, they're looking for pairs of numbers that make 10 and recognising that actually there are five bundles of 10 and five more, which, of course, would be 55. But the great teacher of mathematics does not stop there. The great teacher of mathematics is looking for an alternate strategy or something perhaps more sophisticated, or a student wants to challenge the idea that this is the best way. And I know in a great classroom who, are, who have been well taught that some students would say, well, what about if we bundle them a different way and say, you know, you know what, miss, I could actually make bundles of 11, that if I put rather than the one with the nine, what about what if I put the one with the 10 and the two with the nine and so forth? And so we start to have this great mathematical discussion in the classrooms of these great teachers. Now, of course, not every student can do this mentally. So the great teacher of mathematics has thought through what are the types of materials and representations that make this really visible and salient for every student. They might have already asked a student to say, can you just go about representing one to 10 and then show using materials how we can manipulate those numbers to make those combinations of 10, not just through knowledge, but visually, what does it look like? And of course, how we rearrange them to make bundles of 11 and whichever way we do it, we have 55. They'd also be looking for some alternate equivalent number sentences and thinking beyond the associative property to thinking about, well, what about this, that distributive property? Because indeed, if we know that five groups of 10 plus five more is the same as five 11s, we can also say that five 11s is the same as five tens and another five ones. And at that point, we are bringing these properties and principles to the surface and engaging in exploring important ideas. Of course, so it doesn't stop there, does it? The great teacher of mathematics notices what the students can and can't do as they engage in these tasks. And then they provide that really targeted practice for their students. I know year three students well. Some won't recognise and recall those number bonds and they need more practice with them. Some students need to recognise and create equivalent statements and lots of practice at doing so. Some just need practice at the new bit we're learning now, the associative property as a mental strategy. And some students can move beyond this to being able to decide when to select this particular property of mathematics and, and to use it to create those efficient mental strategies for a range of problems. I want to come now to one of those other important words I mentioned, that great teachers of mathematics display this attribute of positivity. They believe that with the right experiences, tasks, support and challenge, and that subject-specific self-efficacy, that every student in their classroom can improve their performance. 
If you want to be a great teacher, you need to perceive every student as a potential mathematician. You need to think about differentiation as the opportunity to make a difference to each student's learning rather than to make the students different from each other. You need to provide rigorous, challenging tasks that allow students to engage in productive struggle and to trust in your own capability to help each student access or move beyond the task. And also, you need to expect every student to formulate their own response and to contribute to the learning of the class. Let me talk about passion. A great teacher of mathematics is passionate about teaching, about student learning, about mathematics, about mathematics education, and about solving problems. Passion, in fact, is the secret weapon of a great mathematics educator. If you want to be a great mathematics teacher, you need to get excited about the ideas in the mathematics you're teaching. You need to share and celebrate students' ideas, those light bulb moments and aha moments in the classroom, and you need to use those moments to renew and sustain your energy and the energy of the class. A great mathematics teacher anticipates the possible student responses by doing the task themselves before the lesson and developing some novel and elegant solutions that will make the class excited and they captivate students' interest in the mathematics by bringing the concepts to life in really memorable and visual ways. What we know, and that's quite interesting in terms of upcoming research, is that teachers' own enjoyment for teaching mathematics has important implications for the quality and quantity of mathematics instruction that their students receive. And beyond that, we also know that a teacher's excitement for the mathematics and how they're going to teach it at the very start of a lesson is a strong predictor of the outcome of the lesson. And I think that work of Peter Sullivan, uh, James Rousseau, Jeanette Bobbis and colleagues is such an exciting field of research. So I suppose great teachers really need to get excited about the maths teaching. I think it came out in the survey None of this is possible without being proficient in mathematics ourselves. If we want to be great, we need to know the mathematics we teach. And I'm a great fan of those intertwined strands of mathematical proficiency by Kilpatrick, Swofford and Findel. Adaptive reasoning, strategic competence, conceptual understanding, productive disposition and procedural fluency. This is what we indeed need for students, but those strands of mathematical proficiency apply as much to ourselves as teachers as they do to our students. Because if we cannot do the mathematics and if we do not have the disposition to the mathematics, it is a really hard sell to our students. My area of research and expertise has been studying relationships between aspects of teacher knowledge. And this, this theoretical framework is really communicating to you that a teacher's own subject matter knowledge and their confidence in it is a driving force in their opportunity to increase and deepen their knowledge for teaching those pedagogical aspects. So if we increase and deepen our own understanding of the subject matter and our confidence in teaching it, we can use that to help drive improvement in those pedagogical aspects of teaching. For example, if I use the Australian professional standards and, and recognising not everyone is from Australia, but one of our standards is to know the content and how to teach it. But you can't know the content and how to teach it if you can't solve mathematical problems. And of course, we need to be able to plan for and implement effective teaching and learning. And if we want to do that, we need to design, select and implement rich and challenging tasks. But of course, there's no good doing that if you can't solve those problems and tasks yourself. And in Standard 5, we talk about being able to assess, provide feedback and report on student learning. But how do we provide feedback to students on their solution strategies and how to improve if we ourselves cannot solve the problems? So to notice the thinking of our students, we need to know and understand the mathematics that we are teaching. To use an analogy from Polya, which is um, back to about 1936, but very apt, I think we could say that if you want to learn how to swim, you need to get into the water. 
But if you want to be a great mathematics teacher, you need to get into problem solving. And I'll just pause there for a moment because I can see that there's a, a hand raised. Um, if you've got any questions, we're going to do a Q&A at the end. So please type them into the Q&A box and I promise we'll try and get to everybody at the end. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Jackie. So a little bit about knowledge. One of the things I found was that teachers who are able to solve more unfamiliar non-routine problems were far more likely to design cognitively challenging tasks for their students and notice sophisticated mathematical thinking in students' responses to non-routine problems. There's a few quotes on the page. I'm not going to go through those, but you might just cast your eye over them. At the end of the day, to teach mathematics effectively, we as primary teachers need an abundance of subject matter knowledge. And many people would have us believe that the amount of knowledge we need is less than a secondary teacher of mathematics, but that is absolutely not true. It's the depth of knowledge, that conceptual understanding, we need to the same extent as our secondary colleagues in that sort of, say, hour of the day where you are teaching mathematics, you are a mathematics teacher and you need to be confident and knowledgeable and deep in your subject matter knowledge. When I look at these relationships between aspects of teacher knowledge, teachers' abilities to solve non-routine problems really explained um, over 50% or 57.7% of the variance in the levels of challenge in the tasks they provided for students and also explained 45.4% of the variance in teachers' ability to notice the thinking of their students. So taking time to solve problems and feel confident in problem solving is extremely important. Bringing that together, you can see on this graphic that when you actually put these together, that, that high level of subject matter knowledge and the ability to solve those non-routine problems is if you're high in that area, not just are you typically high on one of those other aspects of pedagogical knowledge, but typically you're high on all. I'm not saying that um, having high subject matter knowledge means you'll definitely be a great mathematics teacher. I'm saying if you don't possess it, it will limit how great you can become. So great teachers of mathematics spend time solving those unfamiliar non-routine problems. And when they've solved them one way, they go back and they solve them again in more efficient and sophisticated ways. Finishing up, I want to talk about commitment. So positivity, passion and knowledge, these are hallmarks of great mathematics educators. But without commitment, we are nothing. Great teachers of mathematics have growth mindsets. They never say that a student can't. They say they can't yet. And then they set about moving the student towards that goal. Great mathematics teaching is exciting and it's rewarding, but let's not kid ourselves. It is hard work and it requires resilience and persistence on our part. As great mathematics teachers, we need to be able to solve teaching problems as well as mathematics problems. So as great teachers of mathematics, I think we need to remember this. A great discovery solves a great problem but there's a grain of discovery in the solution of any problem. Everything you discover about mathematics and mathematics teaching is taking you towards that greater and bigger solution. Great mathematics teaching is the great discovery of students and mathematics together. To be a great mathematics teacher is to solve a great problem. I hope everyone goes away tonight being really energized by every discovery they make and celebrates their own brilliance in solving mathematical problems and teaching problems. Thanks, everyone. Wow. Thank you, Christine, so much to think about. That was really quite inspiring. And, you know, just to pick on a couple of things that you, you said there, I was actually pleased you talked a little bit about George Pollio because I've run a couple of webinars. I can't remember if it was this year or last year now. I'm 
times um, escaped me, but it was, uh, we called it the problem with problem solving. And I often refer to George Pollier in, in those webinars. We'll move on that. But as a classroom teacher, it's been a little while, seven years, but I did it for a very long time. A couple of the things I, I, that resonated with me was about allowing time for students um, to think. And it's so tempting. We're so time poor in the classroom. It's so tempting just to show the method. <laughs> you know, we think that, you know, if we're running out of time and also the difficulties with, um, you might have one student that might have solved that problem very quickly and another one that just needs time. And it's always hard to balance that and to differentiate. So um, thank you for your advice on that. And also multiple exposures. This is something that I talk about often when I, I'm training teachers um, is, you know, I'm representing what I think is a wonderful uh, digital online and online maths resource. But I say to teachers all the time, this isn't the only thing you need now. <laughs> you should be using a range of tools because you're going to have a range of and diverse range of learners in your classroom some are visual some are audio audio and some are hands-on and you need to try to or multiple touch points I guess so thank you thank you very much Christine I'm just going to share my screen again with you uh, let's get that back there there we go hopefully you can all see that and I'm going to actually very quickly just show you a little bit about Vitific and then we're going to just go across the Tasman to Olwen um, I've got a question for you. Are you using an online maths resource at your school right now? Now, the reason that I ask you that is what does it look like What for the from the student's perspective? If it looks like this, go and have a look at their screens when they're using an online resource. Because if it looks like this, it might be time for a change. Because I can assure you that even in 2022, there are still a lot of online resources that look a little bit like this. It's kind of like a worksheet on a screen or just question answer, tick or across, and it's a little bit like a test. Um, and you know, with technology, you can do so much more. Now you'll probably see on your screen there, I'm gonna show you an example of some activities on Matific. The technology is amazing. I'll play that little video now. There's a, you can see there, there's a QR code. Uh, we're happy for you to use Matific free to the end of this year. So at any point in time, feel free to scan that QR code and register. If you haven't had a free trial before, that would be great. If this time of year doesn't suit you for a trial, don't worry, still scan it and register and your local rep will get in touch with you and we can organise a time to trial it. One of the lovely things about Matific, apart from these amazing graphics, look at that, I, I'm always said I'm not very good spatially, but I've got better since I've been doing this activity. But one of the differences with Matific is the pedagogy. There's no big red cross if they make an error. If they make an error, the student gets to try again, they get multiple attempts and there's scaffolding and guidance built into every one of our activities to help them. You can see if you're going to use technology, that's the kind of thing that you're looking for, not just a ticket across at a score. There are thousands of these activities. And I did say to you, I'm going to talk about going beyond the screen because I think a lot of people use online maths poorly, just as a little babysitter for a few minutes. But there's so much more you can do with one like this because it represents real world objects beautifully. For example, balance scales, we've all used them in the classroom, haven't we? And we never have enough and they're often broken. So it's nice that you can use both. You can match up your digital with what you're doing in the classroom. Look at this one with a protractor. It really does feel like I'm using a real protractor. So I often like using it in rotational groups. Some would be on their iPad, some would be using a real protractor, some would be doing some written work and rotate. And look at this one about area. You know, we teach that the formula, if you like, of area is length times width, but why? They can visualise the concept here. We, I know that Christine talked about the importance of conceptual understanding. This is going to help develop that. How fantastic it is. I've used it in the classroom as an instructional tool. Put it up on your big screen and then you can also assign it for students to do. And this is a great one for the older students too about probability, rolling the dice. You know, it can be very time consuming <laughs> doing activities like this to prove um, probability. But this is actually getting you to visualise it. Roll it 20 times, another 20 times, another 20 times. You can see that column graph, how the likely results is starting to build in the center. So a great way to visualize those concepts. Just moving along too, this is just going to show you what it looks like from a teacher's point of view to find content easy. You've got access to every year level. I'm in Australia, so you can see I've got the Australian curriculum there. But 
It's also mapped to the Oxford text. So you can even search by the textbook. If you're using the Oxford textbook, there's a whole lot from Unit 2, Year 5, Fractions and Decimals. So it's really easy to use. So don't forget, um, scan that QR code, and we're happy to give you free access to the end of this year. And as I said, if that doesn't suit you, um, we can always do it at another time. So feel free to scan that, and, yeah, we'll give you free access to Matific till the end of the year. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we are about to travel across the Tasman over to Olwen. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hello, Olwen. Welcome. How are you? You Very well, thank you. That's Thank you for joining us. That's really good. Now, I hate mispronouncing names, so can you please tell us where you're from? I am from Tawa in oh, Wellington. I like that. Tawa Primary <laughs> I didn't want to risk getting it wrong. So, and that is in the Wellington area, I believe. Yes, it right? is. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to disappear again and hand, hand it over to you, Olwen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, are you sharing my screen? No, I'm sharing my screen. Let me just go there. Now, how have we got Diwali up? You can tell I'm a classroom teacher, can't you? Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Alwyn Taiko Ingo, welcome and thank you, Mick Tiffik, for having me here tonight. So if you're after what makes a great maths teacher, don't ask a Kiwi because our results have been declining something horrifically not just in mathematics, but in reading, which is my specialist area, also in science. In fact, our maths data is so bad, we are below the OECD average. A few years ago, we brought in the numeracy project. This was supposed to solve our problems. We had a bigger decrease. So looking at what we do in New Zealand really isn't the best. The story is even sadder. Not only are our worst students getting worse, our good students are getting worse also. Why is this? What are the problems in New Zealand? We've got a constructivist curriculum and ideology drives us. We've been told that teachers should be guides on the side, not the sage on the stage. There is a lack of systematic, sequential and explicit instruction. In fact, we've been almost told that we shouldn't be standing in front of a classroom. Teacher knowledge, and I was delighted to hear Christine talking about this. Teacher knowledge is so important. Evidence is not driving our teaching and learning in New Zealand. And the science of learning is not known by all educators. And it's not our fault. I'm no teacher basher. I am a teacher. My specialty is science of learning from there, the science of reading and interstructured literacy. And I've stopped and looked at the data and said, hang on a minute, we need to be looking and almost unstitching our what Chris, Dr. Christine Bray calls our teaching DNA, because this has been happening for such a long time, the decline, that as a child, I was taught in this constructivist curriculum. As a teacher, it's what I know, but it's not all doom and gloom. If we look at the science of learning, teachers need to know about the cognitive load theory. How much can the brain cope with? And there's so much now in the neuroscience how the brain learns in the mathematics brain is different to the reading brain. How big is a child's post-it? We know that for people, there is a range between one new piece of information to nine pieces of information. But for most people, it's about four pieces. There's some brilliant work actually out of Australia on cognitive load that we can access. How often as a teacher have I found a lesson's been going really, really well? The children have got it, so I just take it that one step further. And oops, a lot of them, have they've lost it. I've gone too far. 
Now I have a really good understanding of cognitive load theory, the difference between working memory and long-term memory. My lessons are slicker. This isn't just about mathematics. This is about learning. And I forgot to put my timer on because I've been told not to go any longer than 10 minutes. So someone might have to take my screen away. The other thing is the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. We teach a really good lesson, but it's natural that we forget a lot of what we learn. And that's why, again, Christine spoke about spaced practice so that we can revisit lessons, revisit the key concepts, and that keeps the learning alive and helps it to go into long-term memory. Good teachers, good maths teachers, know this stuff and do it. Another key is the gradual release model. So the teacher I do, then we do it together. You do it on our watch and guide. You do it alone. For those students who don't just get this stuff, as a teacher, I do, I do, I do. We do, we do, we do. You do, you do, you do. For our precocious learners, showing them once, checking it together once, that might be enough. Again, all children can learn as long as we are teaching the way that the brain learns to read. Sorry, learns to do mathematics. We have children who are dyscalculic. So we need to make sure that the way we are teaching teaches to the way that they need to learn. We need to think about a pedagogical shift. For me, I have looked around the world and gone, ah, I like what I see is coming out of Singapore. Singapore used to be one of those countries at the bottom of the world with Tim's and Pisa. Now they're at the top of the world and have been for a long time. So there is a pedagogical shift that needs to happen, particularly here in New Zealand, Aotearoa. We're going to get teachers who are the innovators and ready to hop on board and the early adopters. There will be the laggards. That is normal. This will be, for us in New Zealand, an uncomfortable pedagogical shift if we want to be great teachers of mathematics. There are some here already. We need all of us to be there because we have to turn around our data. So Singapore's mathematics framework and again, I looked and smiled with Christine's work. And I hate to admit, but Australia, you're further ahead than we are because your rope matches to Singapore's mathematical framework. And you can see there, one of the things with the Singapore maths is doing less, doing it better. Okay. Less content, but going deeper. Again, Christine and I haven't spoken before this, but there is so much here in common because good practice has all of these features in it that a good maths teacher has to have knowledge. They've got to know different ways to solve problems and be passionate about what they're doing. The crux of Singapore is concrete to pictorial to abstract. And again, and also looking at the Mactific, um little presentation done a moment ago, I can see how this fits so beautifully. Singapore concrete materials, and they don't need to be flash. They can be a whole lot of paper clips. Christine's example showed either place value blocks or Cuisinier rods. Then to the pictorial, the Christine Hand, hers was pictorial. The Matific presentation was pictorial. Into the abstract, so that's when we start the abstractions, the writing of um, formulas of equations. And then the application 
into problem solving. Practically, the good old Cuisinier rods. Some of these language in New Zealand classrooms. I've been using this, I'm currently teaching a year five and six class that I picked up mid-year. I brought the Cuisinier rods into the classroom and they all wanted to build towers with them. They'd never used them as maths equipment. I held up the orange rod and said, how long do you think this is? And I had children saying, oh, anything from five centimetres to 20 centimetres. So it shows that they don't have that good conceptual understanding of measurement. Using Cuisinier rods has so many applications in mathematics, number bonds, bar modelling, which is a huge part of Singapore maths, measurement. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen there and come back to this. The good old multi-links. And just to give you a quick example, because I'm very aware of time, if you have two colours of these multi-links in classrooms, if you've got all the colours, a lot of the kids spend a lot more time worrying about which colour blocks they've got than worrying about the mathematics. This is a very, very quick run through of a lesson that I have done over the last week. And I've always found for the children teaching mixed numerals and improper fractions has been really difficult. Started off talking to the children about how many quarters are there in a hole. They fairly quickly got it that there are four. So this now represents one hole. They were very happy with that. So what's this? Two. Oh, what's this? Two and, oh, two and a quarter, two and one fourth. And there was all the language that went on about that. So there we had two and a quarter. How many quarters was that? And very quickly, those students managed to work out that that was nine quarters. We spent a whole day. If this represents a whole, oh, they're thirds. Sorry, get that one out of the way. It's two. Nice. That's three. Oh. Three and two thirds, and we could put them all together. Eleven thirds. Next day, we went the other way. Children who had struggled with maths struggled with improper fractions and mixed numerals, got it. I've just had yet another message from a parent tonight. What are you doing in that classroom, Alwyn? My boy, who has hated maths, has come home and told me all about mixed numerals and improper fractions. New Zealand has a long way to go, and fortunately, we've got a big curriculum refresh happening here at the moment. And I really hope that we look at how the brain learns to read, Sorry, read. <laughs> Brain learns to, to both read and to do maths. They are different circuitries. And I hope that we look to those countries that are at the top of the world, and particularly for me, Singapore. So I'll hand back to you, and I'm right on time. Wow, thank you so much, Alwyn. I loved that slightly different perspective, that, the science of it. I loved it. Um, yeah, and, and the quiz and air rods, I have to say, I actually used them when I was a student, which is many decades ago, a long time ago, and my memory is of building towers. It was only as a teacher, years later, that it made sense. I suddenly thought, this is amazing. This actually, and yes, I had tray a tray filled with quiz and air rods, and every now and then out they would come. Um, and we'd use them. And, yeah, just sometimes everything old is new again. 
Well, what you will find when you find the Cuisinier rods at school, when you find the place value blocks, is all the ones have gone because they've been fired around the classroom and gone up the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so you've got to go and buy a whole lot more units. About right. And, and the other thing that resonated so much is about the forgetting because you'd, I'd be so excited, particularly fractions seem to be the one more than any other topic, where finally you'd think that ch the child or children have they've grasped it. This is so exciting. And then we'd go back to it in a couple of weeks' time and they'll blink again. It's a bit heartbreaking when that happens, but it it's is. practice, practice, isn't it? It's space thank practice you. and it's review. Yep. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much. Please stick around and we'll try and get to some Q&A at the end, which is a reminder in that Q&A box, please type your questions for any of the panellists. And now we're going to switch over to Matt. Hello and welcome. Hello, Hi, Queensland. Jackie. Thank you for having me. And uh, hi, everybody. Good to you. Good um, to just see to you. introduce you. And that is very special because we ran a competition all around Australia recently on World um, Teachers Day and it was to find the best maths teachers in our primary schools and not only Matt was nominated, he was one of our winners. So congratulations to you. I'm sure it's very well deserved. Now you are in Marsden State School and you are a pedagogical coach there, is that correct? Yeah, so I've recently moved into that role, but formerly a, um, a classroom teacher uh, focusing in the middle years areas of year three and year four for the last uh, five or six years. All right, well, it's great to have you join us. So I'm going to disappear and hand it over to you. Fantastic. Um, I'll just get my screen shared and uh, we should be good to go. So one of the things that uh, has been uh, really nice to hear is uh, between Christine and Olwyn, we weren't uh, sharing our presentations beforehand, but we've all managed to intertwine everything that we talk about. So one of the things that I want to talk about today uh, is retrieval practice. And this is one of the first things that Christine touched on um, about the importance of making sure that once you teach a concept, you spend the time and you're able to go back and revisit that to be able to strengthen the pathways. And so once you learn something, um, it heads off into your long-term memory. And quite often we see inside the classroom that what students are struggling and unable to do is retrieve that back when they're asked a question. The best way that I can put this for adults is imagine you're at trivia and a question gets asked and you know you know the answer to it. However, you don't have the skills or a strong enough connection to be able to pull that information from your long-term memory back into your short-term working memory to be able to answer it. And this is what retrieval practice is um, by constantly going back and having a look. You guys have already heard about this one from Olwen and it's Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. And you can see that once you first teach a concept, um, the retention rate is 100%. However, if you leave that a day and don't go back and revisit it, you lose approximately 20% of that knowledge. And as time goes by, you gradually lose the retention of it completely. However, if you do go back and revisit it after the first day, you can see that you are able to retain 100% of it again. As you do this over time, uh, you begin to space your practice out and you're able to go a longer distance without being able to forget that knowledge. And that's all about strengthening those pathways inside your brain to be able to retrieve that back out. One thing that I developed uh, at my school uh, to work on this with my students is something called a daily review. And I'm sure many of you have probably heard of this before or might even be implementing it yourself. Uh, but what you can see here is a week by week guide of concepts that we have previously taught and we want to go back and retrieve. So down the bottom here, you can see all of the, the concepts that we're looking at and those skills within the concepts that we're going to teach as long as some tight properties that we do when we do these sort of lessons. If we have a look at place value to start with, uh, this is actually a term three uh, daily review guide for us. But the first two days are place value um, and we don't really have that space practice. We want to bring that knowledge back to the students' heads. But then we leave it a couple of days, touch another concept, and then visit place value again. We then start to space that gap out longer before we start to continue to go back to revisit it because we want to strengthen those pathways to allow the students access to be able to get into their long-term memory and retrieve it. 
Once we've done this, uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll show you an example of what the lesson sequence looks like. So this is just four slides that I've taken screenshots of, and this is an addition uh, daily review. So when the students come in, they're given three questions, uh, all at year level standard, and the pink bar up the top is a bit of a timer that they get that lets them know how long they've got to complete it. Once the time's up, it pops up with the answers, and as expected, how it should be shown and the working out done. And then we have some sentence stems that we as our entire cohort say uh, to be able to ensure that we're still able to read those, read those numbers. Over on the side here, we've got a bit of a traffic like system which says, well, how many are you getting right? You know, red being none, yellow being some of them and green being able to master that. And all of this is completely anonymous with the students. And once they finish their daily review, they just come and pick up a colored counter and place it into um, a little container. As teachers, we collect that data and we're able to track how students go over time. So for example, having a look at the place value, Red being not many students able to get it, started at three. Well, there's a large number of students saying, mm, we're getting some of it, but we're not getting all of it. And you can see that there is a large number of students inside this classroom that do get it. However, once we've retrieved it, you can see that place value two, we've seen a massive shift where all of those students that struggle to retrieve all of it out of their long-term memory were actually able to, on the second time, retrieve a lot more. When we head down to place value five, you can see that we're still getting some large numbers of students that are able to retrieve all of it. However, that connection is slightly dipped for some of them and they are struggling with elements of it again. So we can start to see that over this term period that we're strengthening those pathways, but we also allow opportunities to go and reteach these concepts. The outcomes of this were really exciting um, with implementation. So we'd spent a lot of time going through PAT testing data to develop the concepts that the students were struggling at. And over in 2019, uh, this is the percentage of data growth that you see as average between year three and year four. In 2020, where we implemented a half year, halfway through the year, you can see that that growth has jumped up. And in 2021, when it was a full year implementation of every single day doing a different daily review on a different concept, we over doubled um, the growth of a standardized test uh, during this period. So constantly being able to go and revisit these concepts allowed the students to strengthen that connection within their pathway and be able to solve problems. One of the issues that I always had was when you had students come up to you from a different year level, uh, when you first touch on a subject, let's just say subtraction, it looks and sounds like the students have never actually learned this from the year below. But what we're seeing is that they have, the distance has just been far too great for them to be able to understand and retrieve how to solve that. So what we've been able to do is by implementing the daily reviews, um, they're constantly practicing, we're strengthening those pathways with space practice um, to be able to allow the students to have a greater understanding and master these concepts as they head into the next year level. Thank you, Jackie. That's just my little five-minute presentation. Oh, thank I wanted you, to keep Matt. It that nice was and that relevant. was a really powerful five minutes because, like I was saying before, we used to use a scope and sequence, and there would often be quite a gap between topics. You might think they've got grass fractions, but then you're not doing it again for a while. So I think this cons consistency with reviewing is fantastic. And it's interesting that we just had some people in the chat box. I think it was Kylie and then Charlene. So they want you to come over to New Zealand and, and teach over there. Because what it often takes is one strong leader, you know, someone who's really passionate about maths to just take that lead in the school and get something like this underway. And you've obviously done it at Marston, so well done. Oh, thank you. And if anybody does want any of those resources, I didn't share my email, but I might just pop it in the chat. Um, I'm more than happy to share anything that uh, oh. we've implemented over there as something that uh, you might be able to take back to your school and have a look at. Thank you. That's really kind of you. And if um, Christine and Olin can just pop the cameras back on, we don't have a lot of time for q and I'm afraid, but we do. I can thank Olin. I can see she's already been very dutifully answering some of those questions. So thank you. We had a we had a bit of a, a New Zealand focused question there about some PD, and I think you already answered that one. That's great. Um, Christine, maybe you'd like to um, answer this one too, because Karen Barber, I think she's over in New Zealand, asked the question, 
what if you've got 11 and 12 year olds that are still at the point where they're not um, able to add single digit numbers? What's gone wrong there? What's happened? Yeah, I I loved the fact that Olwen held up some uh, some cubes, some Unifix cubes. So there's a time to learn this. There's a time to know. And it's really sad to me. I, I've actually seen this. In, in fact, in our system, I many years ago, I worked with a colleague and we developed and, and had research to clinical interview. And we sadly found that very syndrome that in, you know, up to about 10% of our year five and six students did not automatically um, know those number bonds for numbers to 10. I was devastated. Uh, but but you can do something about it. And it's got a lot to do with what we've spoken about, about that firstly, that massed practice, that intensive practice to do something until you know it now, and then about that spaced practice, but then moving beyond that to those applications. So let's say, for example, we start with something like this. Don't start with knowing all of the combinations for 10. Let's start with five. And let's start with five cubes in one hand. I'm sorry, I'm, you just have to imagine them for tonight. There's five there. And we have to understand this levelling principle, that if I've got five here and I've got none here, the fact is that five plus zero make five. And then I have to understand the pattern that if I take one off the five and put it in my other hand, I've got a four and a one. And I need to record that, that four and one make five. There's one list here and there's one more here. And then I have to take another one and record three and two. And of course, we realise then that we don't need to learn all of these facts because of the commutative property that once I know three and two make five, the next one is, of course, take another one away. It's two and three make five. Oh, and then guess what? I take another, it's one and four. That's the same as four and one. And having done that, I can model all of those. I learn the pattern and there comes a time to know. And what I like to do is activate two students who are struggling as a resource for each other, where they've recorded what these are. And their job is to say five plus what makes five, for example, or three plus what? And I know I'm starting simple with five, but they've firstly got to learn how to learn it. Now, once they've learned it, the next thing is for them to be able to find those missing number sentences anywhere. So it's something plus one makes five or, you know, five take away something makes four. They've got to recognise it in all its forms so that those bonds are bonded in their minds. And moving beyond that, to engage with then word problems where the missing number is anywhere in the worded problem. So I guess I'm saying to you there are a lot of layers to get them there, and it sounds like a lot of work, but for these children to go off to high school without having that under their belt is an absolute travesty because nothing is making sense to them. So you can do something about it, and we did do something. In fact, we almost eradicated the problem by having – um, not quite the same as MAP, but what we call a daily fluency program, where those students would be spending 10 minutes explicitly practicing that until they could do it and do it well, and then followed by that, that building into the word problems and further space practice. Um, so it is possible, but it is hard work because you're dealing with negative um, disposition at that point because they're struggling. Thank you. And I have to say, Owen and Christine, what a great team you two <laughs> You'd swear you practiced that in advance, and I can promise you they didn't. So thank you so much. And I know we are running a little bit of over a little bit over time, but I've got a question here. Catherine was asking you, Christine. Um, you mentioned I think differentiate to make a difference in learning, not to make students different. Um, mm. Is there somewhere to read more about that? Catherine's asking. Well. I guess that statement is my statement and it's based on a lot of experience, but I think a lot of the time differentiation has become sorting kids into groups. And while we want to provide targeted teaching, sometimes the groups become the identity of the student. And what we have to do is create a culture where every student believes that they can succeed. So the idea is to differentiate and meet the needs of each student but no matter how many times you regroup and group students, they're still going to be different. Like let's imagine there's 30 students and you sort them into six groups of five. Are all of the students in that group, like are they all really struggling with the same thing? And let's imagine you sort them into groups of three. Are all of those three going to need exactly the type? So it's that, that important opportunity to provide that explicit teaching, notice where students are, and make the focus of that differentiated instruction specifically in relation to what that student needs. So, gosh, 
I could give you probably 100 references to read to build that picture, but my key point would be um, Peter Sullivan. Go to Peter Sullivan. He's got quite a lot to say on it about strategies for differentiating um, mathematics, teaching and learning. But um, no matter how many times you sort them into groups, another nice one is the OECD Policies and Practices Guide 2020 is another great place you could go to read about that. Thank you. That's really good advice. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry that we're running out of time very rapidly. I'm just going to share my screen again for you. Um, for those of you who want to scan that QR code that somebody was requesting to put that up again, as I said, you're welcome to have Matific free. Could be the whole school even, if you want, till the end of this year. Um, so just scan that and register. I want to thank Christine Olwen and Matt so much for your time. I think we could have gone on for another hour very easily. So we might organise a, a second one <laughs> next year, early in the new year. I know in the new year we've got planned um, some webinars around the new curriculum that's coming. Um, and I just also wanted to say to Olwen, I know you had hurt it was painful to say that Australia is slightly ahead of New Zealand when it comes to mathematics, but you've got the Bladders Low Cup. <laughs> all to yourself so <laughs> I hope that compensates in some way <laughs> anyway thank you to the three of you and thank you to all of our participants in this webinar this evening there were a lot of you out there so we really appreciate you spending this evening with us um we also we had a few people ask if you were able to share those um screens the slideshows if you're happy to do that please send them to me um, and I can pass them on to the participants. But just to let you all know, there will be a recording. There is a recording that we will share with all of you. So you'll all be able to watch this back and share it with your colleagues as well. All right, I think we're done for this evening. So have a great night, everybody, wherever you are. Stay safe. And I hope to see you again in the future at another one of our webinars. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone.